The words power and sharing capture much of what the microcomputer revolution is all about. It is the power to remember and to organize, the power to calculate, the power to seek patterns, the power to entertain and to amuse, the power to teach skills. In part, this power is a product of microelectronics, but importantly, it is also a product of sharing, sharing ideas, sharing problems and their solutions, sharing enthusiasms. Through the sharing of thousands of individuals, the power grew as new programs were created. Greater power to analyze, to communicate, to create. This series is about the power and about the sharing. My name is Chip Mann, and I am here with John and Barbara McMullen at their home in Jefferson Valley, New York. I am a relatively new user of a microcomputer, and John and Barbara are very experienced users. John is the president of the Big Apple Users Group, and Barbara is the secretary. I am one of the members of this users group. And this morning, we're going to talk a little bit about microcomputers, what they are, what they can do, and how to use them. Why don't we start by your just telling us a little bit about how you happened to get into this field in the first place. All right. We, we each were, have been in data processing at the, uh, at the large mainframe, or the big computer, uh, type of computer that most people are, f are familiar with through television documentaries and, and through working in large organizations. And then we had been in this field for approximately 20 years each. We started uh, our own business, McMullen, uh, in McMullen, in 1978. And at that time, we acquired a microcomputer for our own use, uh, keeping financials, books, and records inventory. Uh, we saw relatively rapidly that this was a whole new field that, in our judgment, had unlimited potential. And uh, since then, I'd have to say we've been proven right. It's been a very uh, exciting three years. We've watched uh, a new technology just uh, grow in leaps and bounds. I don't think anybody can possibly uh, keep up with what's happening in this this uh, new age of the microcomputer and uh, it's uh, it's something that uh, we see as being in everybody's home and everybody's office at some some point and we often when people look at us askance we often think of dear old Alexander Graham Bell and what they must have thought of him when when he said he was going to string these little black boxes through everybody's house and office and uh, uh, it's just one of those uh, terribly exciting periods of time and uh, we've been thrilled to be involved with it. Before I bought the equipment I joined the, the Big Apple users group and came to the meetings and talked to people there about the equipment, what the equipment could do, what suggestions they had and I have found that this whole uh, bringing together or coming together of people around these pieces of equipment is a very interesting development. You might just talk a little about this users group phenomenon that you both have been so much a part of. Well, I think the big word in users groups is sharing, and sharing is, is uh, a very important and interesting aspect of the microcomputer world. Um, you're going to have some initial problems, we all do, and you are not the first one to have these problems, and that is something you should realize right off the bat. And you're going to want to talk to other people who have had similar problems, and we recommend that you form a group and get together regularly, whether it be in person, over, over uh, your micromodem, which is a device that's going to enable you to communicate with the rest of the world, or telephone, whatever other uh, videotape, whatever uh, ever other 
form of communication you may have available to you and share information, not just your problems, but other things. If you are working on a problem, a model, um, discuss it with other people. Perhaps they wish to do something similar and you can provide the framework to them and in return they will give you something. And I think that's the whole emphasis of the Big Apple Users Group, and there are groups all over the uh, world doing similar things. We get together once a month at, in, a, in a general meeting where we look at new hardware, new software. Uh, members demonstrate things that they have developed. Uh, we talk about our problems. And then also once a month, the group breaks out into uh, small groups, subgroups, uh, special interest groups, and the Big Apple Users Group has a multitude of them, including a graphics subgroup, a business subgroup, an education subgroup, uh, a music group, um, word processing group. A, uh, a financial or security analysis yeah. group, and the interests are so diverse in the membership that we uh, that you'll find these small groups that Barbara talks about having 25, 50 members uh, that are into, that have purchased a computer for a specific reason, be it office automation, be it security analysis. We have commercial artists that are developing things in a, uh, for commercial sale through the computer, through, through some of the equipment we'll see when we go inside. In fact, it might be worthwhile to go in and, and to start you know, looking at, at these devices that we've been spending the last few minutes talking about. Shall we do that? Good. This is, is a basic microcomputer system. Uh, this is, is the Apple. Uh, I know you and I have discussed different micros. Any type of computer tends to in intimidate people. So let's get right down to basics. Uh, this computer is composed of uh, the number of units. Actually, the computer itself is only this device under these two funny little boxes. Now, to give you a the look from the ground up, let's open everything, and we'll show you what the heart of the computer is. Uh, this will take me a minute or two just to move things around. Okay. Now, this is the heart of the computer. And it's interesting that all of these things sticking up in the air are not really part of the computer system, uh, or of the computer d itself. The computer d itself is this board here. Now, you'll, you'll notice I'm not touching anything because I could cause some problems if I tried to move any of these boards with the machine being on. All of these boards are, are allowing the computer to talk to other things, uh, to talk to a printer. And this is a, a representative printer that you'll find on the Apple computer, on the IBM computer, on other things. This is called the Epson MX100. IBM and Hewlett Packard have put their own name on a smaller version of, of the MX100, and they market that as part of their system. This device that's connected to the computer is called a, a modem. This plugs directly into a telephone line and allows the computer to talk to those remote database that we discussed earlier, Dow Jones, the source, other things like that. If you had a different type of computer, you would have to use something called an acoustic coupler, which I'm going to reach over here, which is another device that could be connected to the computer. This is a little more difficult to use in that you have to use your standard telephone and then plug the top into this the way I am. This is the, the type of device though that we would have to send uh, to most foreign installations because the, the micro modem tends not to work with older telephone systems. The, these other devices, and I'll explain them as we start putting the computer back together, uh, these two elements are, are disk drives, and if you could think of the disk drive as being very similar to either a record player or a cassette recorder where you have a recording media that you may have either, either data or these programs we called software before on, they are read by the disk drive and they into the computer, so the computer may operate on them. The computer can also write out on to discuss data similar to if 
recording on a uh, on a cassette. Once again, this was the uh, device that allows us to talk through telephone lines, and we top it off with a monitor or a television set. This happens to be a professional black and green Sanyo monitor. Uh, you will also find systems that come uh, with color monitors. People unfortunately tend to think of color as, as a step up from black and white. It's really a different thing. Color you tend to use for graphic displays and for presentation. You do not get the same quality of data resolution for text that you do on a uh, on on a black and white, or even better, on a black and green system. John, why don't you tell us a little bit about the different classes of software that uh, you're going to talk about this morning, just to give a general overview of what sorts of things one can reasonably expect a system like this to accomplish. All right. We we will get into some demonstrations later of the various packages. Uh, a representative system is normally uh, composed of a number one, a, a analysis tool that's user friendly that can be used for a variety of purposes called PhysiCalc. Generally, uh, for our client base anyhow, the, uh, the ability to communicate across telephone lines. Also, the uh, a, a, a statistical analysis package and, and a word processing system. What I'll do now, moving through that, is, is to turn the system over to Barbara and, and we'll go through uh, the VisiCalc program. VisiCalc is a gigantic spreadsheet. It has, uh, consists of columns and rows. There are 64 columns across the top and 254 rows down the side. Now, each column and row, as they intersect, uh, forms a matrix entry. For each matrix entry, and I've never calculated how many there are, 64 times uh, 254, I don't know what that is, but to each one of these matrix entries, you can apply any formula that you can construe. Uh, and you can enter text or numbers or whatever. And we'll see in the model that we look at later on, if you were to uh, put a list of numbers in one column, say column B, and then we were to put another list in column C and multiply the two lists, we, and the, the result of that multiplication were in column C, Whenever we changed what was in column A or B, C would automatically change. And it's a very interesting uh, and powerful package. You'll notice I've taken one diskette out, and I've, I'm putting in something called a VisiCalc program diskette. And you're putting it into the... Into disk drive one. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to issue a computer command that will appear nonsensical, but it will tell the computer to go out and to call on whatever's on, on disk drive one, to read it into the computer, and to allow me then to execute it. Now, Barbara mentioned earlier that it was 64 or, or, or 63 columns wide. You'll notice that this cursor that tells me where I am is moving all the way over all the way over to to column BK. Now that represents a it's a, a 63 column matrix. It also, if I bring it all the way down, and you'll see the row numbers going very rapidly by, it will come down to row two, 254. So the screen only shows a small part of the whole. That's correct. However, you will find that through the use of a printer as such, does this, you may print any portion of the matrix that will fit on the printer. Now, now what I'll do is I will take the system back to the upper portion of the matrix, and I will, and I will do a, sh a short example to show you some of, some of the power of PhysiCalc. If I had a simple thing that I wanted to put in quantities times some rate to generate an amount, I might say here I here I want to put a quantity 
and we'll say it's two. Uh, in the next column, it's going to be an amount. So I will I will issue another computer command to set it up as dollars and cents, and I'll say that is two dollars and forty eight cents. And I have a column then to the right that I want to have be, be my total amount. And I'll say that here uh, my amount is the product of a multiplication of what's in A1 times what's in B1. And I also want to show that as dollars and cents. Now, I don't want to have to enter, en enter that formula every time, so I can through the most powerful command in VisiCal called replicate, I can duplicate that same formula. And, and let's say I, I knew there was a maximum of 100 entries. I'm going to duplicate it from position C2 down to position C101. It is, it is now going to ask me some questions. And the questions relate to whether the, the elements of of my formula are going to change as my answer changes. For instance, when I get down to position C10, am I still going to be dealing with the element that was in A1, or am I now going to be dealing with A10? In, in a case that there was a, a fixed hourly wage, for instance, that would always be in, in one location, that would never change. Here, in my little example, that will change, and this will change. Now I've set a formula up for 100 rows. And when I come over here and I enter now 33, and I then enter that these items cost 548, you'll notice as soon as I hit the return button to put the, the 548 in, I will have an answer. Now, this is some of the power. Now, obviously, if, if I wanted to produce a report, it, it would not just be all numbers. So what I would do then, I would. I would put titles on, and I will, will open up some blank rows to do this. The interesting thing when we get into the system itself is that all of these formulas have now adjusted. This has moved to C3, and the element of the, of, of the formulas are now C1 and, and C2. So I'll very rapidly set up the uh, titles, and then we'll go on to something else. Here I said before this was a quantity. Perhaps I'll just abbreviate that. I'll move over here and I'll call this price. And and I'll move, let's see, I want to format, right? And I'll move over here and I'll call this amount. Now I can save this, and I can come back later, and I, I can add elements. I can also say that I want to print a portion of it, and it will ask me some data processing buzzwords, and I can let me first adjust my printer, which I believe we turned off before, and let me set the paper up so I can print properly on it. There we go. Back online, and now I'm moving it down to the lower portion of the matrix that I wish to print. As soon as I hit the return button, it, it will begin printing. I think the interesting thing to and I now uh, have my report. Realize also at this point is that John has done uh, quite a bit of work there for this model already. Now, once he's done this work, that's all there is. He has to do it once. And then he can save the model as a mask without any data in it and save it on the diskette. Then any time he wishes to use that model, he will bring the mask into the computer, put any new data, new information, of quantities, amounts, and the whole model will automatically regenerate. If this were for Feb February's work, then he could save it under the name Model February. And then in March, load in an, a, a blank matrix again, add March's information, <coughs> and save it.
John, I wonder if you could give us some idea, you and Barbara, of the general sorts of things that a professional might use this equipment for. All right. Uh, we, we touched briefly before on, 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 on the VisiCalc package that really is the basis of the majority of, of these systems. Now, we will, and we will spend some time later stepping through all of the commands in VisiCalc. Right now, we'll get into the other packages that might re relate to it. Now, the, the types of systems that you'll see a, a professional are using uh, would be a, a statistical or a, or, or a graphics package that, w that would actually do, do time series analysis, plot, show various uh, the things in a, in, in a graphic way for presentations and for analysis. That would be one type of interface or of system. Another would be word processing, uh, where you would use the system to replace a typewriter in the, in, in the drafting, correction, and production of, of reports and memoranda. A, a third thing would be communications, and we'll show using the computer getting into the various remote databases, one of which is Dow Jones, and we'll show how that works. Also, another system that uh, we'll get into and, and we'll talk about is a database management system. Now, uh, there are uh, many of these database systems also interfaced with VisiCalc and the statistical package. So you can put data in through one of the systems, do your analysis in VisiCalc, pass it on for graphic representation to, to Visitrend and, and then produce printed output perhaps through the, the word processing system. So they all tend to hang together. Now, now Barbara has, has already loaded in to the computer this Visitrend vis, uh, a plot package and has brought some data in that, that will do some graphic analysis on. Now, I caution you just for demonstration purposes, the, the data is not all that meaningful. Uh, it's, it's, it's presented solely to demonstrate the power of, of the system. Barbara, why don't you so chip one of the All right. things we brought What in. I've done is, uh, and this you do not see on the monitor, I have loaded in a file which consists of uh, a number of series of data. And I'm going to, uh, I could have then performed some statistical analysis of it. For example, I could have uh, performed a moving average. I could have uh, uh, gotten cumulative totals, performed a regression analysis, or whatever. And then from each of these analyses, I also uh, generate more series. Once I've, I have all my series generated, I can go to the visiplot portion of it, where we're at now, and I can select line charts, bar charts, area charts, pie charts, high-low charts, scattergrams, or any combination of them, and plot uh, any uh, one or more of my series. For example, I'll select a bar chart, and I'll select a normal bar chart, and I get a list of all the series that are available to me. So here we have earnings, dividends, book value, and other uh, uh, security information. Let's just work with the three series at the top, which are year, yearly data, and I've got 17 occurrences of the data. And I will plot on the bar chart earnings and dividends. And I will plot. Now the system is going to scale it the way it thinks I would want it scaled. I always have the option to change that, but we'll just look at what we get here. And it's starting with the first bar chart. And it will stack the second one on top of it. So this is dividends that you're getting now, is it? Yes. And here are my earnings. Now, just to see how you can add uh, one thing on top of another, let's uh, uh, select uh, a line chart and let's go to book value and plot the book value as a line chart on top of our bar chart. 
Now this particular series is going to go off the charts because the scale is different and we'll see what happens. It tells us that it's off the scale, but we can still display what is on the scale. And let's see where we go. And there it goes, right off the chart. But here is uh, my series. I also ha uh, then can do a great many things with this to make it very elaborate and fancy. I can put all sorts of titles wherever I wish. I have titles I could put at the top, and I'll just put one in so you can see it. I'll put in this as a title, and I can put it in bold or normal type, and I put in this as a title. Once you have your picture, and you can, uh, and then uh, you've looked at it, you can then print it out on the printer. I have an example of a pie chart here. I, I don't know how, if you can see it, but this was printed out. Here's the regular size. And here's a reduced version of it, and you could uh, print it in either of these two Now, sizes. the other thing that you can do with this is very interesting, Jeb, is that this system provides for color output. So if we were using a color monitor, we would show this in various colors. And when I say it provides for, for color output, in some organizations, they, they have an app hooked up to an advent 12-foot screen at permanently in a meeting room. So they would then be able to use this as part of a presentation. If you choose to use it as part of a presentation, you can either have the system build an animation the way Barbara just showed, or you could save these things as still slides, and you could bring the entire system up as a slideshow. And it's something that's extremely effective for a management presentation. I think that perhaps that we could leave this and go on to uh, the communications or the, the word processing, uh, which would you rather see first? Well, why don't we go, which do you have on there, Barbara? Which I'm, is the most convenient? They're both I'm available. Just, uh, how about if we go on to word processing, because this is a, a, another one of these very valuable tools. Um, word processing, when we think of word processing, we think of somebody uh, replacing a typewriter with a piece of hardware. And that's true to a certain degree. We can think of it that way, but I prefer to think of it as a tool for everyone to assist them in composing or correcting any sort of text. We all do reports or, or, or letters or other uh, documents. I've loaded in a package called Magic Window, which is the uh, one I prefer and is for the occasional user. And uh, very quickly, we can do various things with a word processor. We can edit our text. We can enter it, change it, whatever. And we'll look at that subsystem in a minute. This is a list of the various subsystems that we have available to us. We want to format our text, and if we look at what's involved in formatting, all it is is describing to the computer what our physical page, our paper, is going to look like. Here I'm using 8.5 by 11 paper, and uh, I know that 8.5 by 11 paper has 66 lines on a page, so I have described this 8.5 by 11 paper to it. I can file anything that I have created, any text that I've created. Now I can uh, save it on my floppy diskette, and at some future time, I can load it back into the computer and change it. If it's a, a letter to Mr. Jones, I can take the same letter, change Jones to Smith, and send it out to Mr. Smith. I can also print my text, and this is the printer subsystem. And here I have a choice of printing only page 7 or page 1 to 10. I can uh, stop after each page if I'm using my own personalized stationery. The printer that we're using, the one we, we find is uh, most useful in most situations, does allow you to, to use your own stationery. Now let me key some text in just so you can get a feel for some of the things we do with word processing. I'm going to key in, this is a draft. And I'm going to center it. And I'm also going to put 
two pound signs here and I'm going to put this in the top margin. So I have, this is a draft centered and the two pound signs are where this word processing system is going to generate page numbers, wherever it founds, finds the pound sign. This is a draft and the page numbers will appear on every page of our text. Now let me just key in memorandum. I'll center it again. And let's key in a quick uh, memorandum. This will just be a memorandum from the boss on vacations. Oops, subject. How did you, you made a mistake there, how did you uh, correct it? All I did on that was to ret retype it. I just moved my arrow back and retyped over it. No white out, nothing like that is necessary. Now I'm just going to line it up. I'm not going to tell you all the commands, uh, but they're extremely easy to learn. And as John said, an, uh, oops, an hour to an hour and a half. And I just want to get some text in here so I can show you some of the power. I'm putting in a tab and I'll put in another tab here and then I can tab back and forth. All right, and now let's key in. Uh, now is the time for all. Now watch when I get to the end of the line. If I'm a hunt and pecker, I can just go right along and hunt and peck. I never have to look at the screen. Oh, man. Notice it brought the word around. It'll never leave a, a portion of the word. It also eliminates any need for hyphenation because it will just make <laughs> everything later and wrap okay. around. Okay. Now one more sentence. When you say wrap around, you mean bringing it down to the next It will bring the whole word down, so you will never have to. Okay. Now I can go to the top of my text. I can go to the bottom of my text. If I really didn't want this here, I could move it on down here. I can delete letters. I can insert space for other words. I I can cut and put in a whole paragraph and then glue it back together again. All right, now we're going to print this uh, little uh, memorandum that we put together. And here we go. We see this is a draft at the top. We're on page two because we printed it once when we broke before. And the actual memo. Now, we also can save this document, and we'll do that right now. We'll go to the Filer subsystem and select Save, and we'll give it a name, and we'll call it Test 1. And now we have it on disk. Anytime we want to use that same text, edit it, and print it again, we can. Now, Barbara. I notice here you have paper in here with holes along the side. Could you put a normal piece of paper in there as well? Yes, I can put any paper I want in here, including the large computer paper that we're all familiar with, with the green and white lines. Uh, and a print on this particular printer, I can print up to 220 characters across the page. Here I've got standard 8.5 by 11 paper, and I can rip off the sides of that. Uh, it's perforated and use this paper to send out. It, uh, it's pretty good. All right. Shall we Thank move you. on to communications? Oh, uh, yes. Why, uh, uh, now, we spoke earlier, and let's go to the blackboard because this may require some explanation, of uh, being able to use the computer to speak to the, outs the outside world. Now, an example of that is here we have the apple in Jefferson Valley, New York. He said here. And in Princeton, New Jersey, down here, we have Dow Jones. And Dow Jones has a computer. And on that computer, 
it maintains uh, news stories and prices for securities. Uh, it will be highly expensive to call from Jefferson Valley to Princeton. So there are two commercial outfits, one called Telnet, and that is a subsidiary of GT&E, and one called TimeNet, that's a similar service, and that's a, a subsidiary of Timeshare. And they provide conduits, or as some people call them, sewers of information that it may pass through. They have local telephone numbers all over the United States. Uh, we're in Upper Westchester, and the nearest phone number is in White Plains. And we will, for what's close to a local phone call, call White Plains, it will go into the network, and we will come down to Princeton. Now, Barbara has already brought up the news and the quote reporter. And one of the, this is a system that's provided from, uh, from Apple Computer to use the Dow Jones system. Now, there are other package, there are packages also provided for other computers by Dow Jones to access their database. The system is coming up now, and we'll take it right from the beginning as though this is the first time we'd ever used the system. To do that, we will have to, number one, customize this system for our telephone number and for, uh, well, we can go right into to the news retrieval. And since we have not customized it yet, it will ask for the telephone number. Once I put this in, we would never have to do it again. In, in White Plains, the telephone number is, is 694-9361. And if you're very quiet, you'll be able to hear the computer dialing chip. I don't know if you can yes. pick it up with the, the fan that comes on from, the, from this, but let's go ahead. And once we make all the connections, and you'll notice this is a very self-explanatory piece of software that it tells you all the way through what it's doing, it will come back and it will ask for our password. Passwords are confidential, and they cause billing to be done to the proper person. When they come back and ask for the password, I'll, I'll just pass it over to Barbara and she'll key it in. You'll notice what she keys in will not be displayed uh, on the screen. So, so even people looking over our shoulder would not be able to pick up our password and to use it for themselves. Three Fs. John, could someone outside of the United States uh, dial into this system? Through they the could if they had, well, they, they could obviously by their long distance telephone call. If they are in places serviced by Telenet, as is Puerto Rico and Mexico, uh, they could. We are now connected to, to Dow Jones. Now, if, if I want, for instance, to look at all the headlines for, for Apple Computer, I know its symbol is AAPL, and it will go out and it will, it, it, will give me all of the headlines for the last 120 days. I, I, can, I can then, if I choose to read one of the stories, uh, I, can, I can pick out that story, I can read it, or I can print it. I can then go on to another security. Now, now these are the most recent stories for Dow. Now, uh, it, is, it, for is, it assigns a story ID. From here on, I just uh, work off this ID. I want to see this story, I key in AP. It tells me where, what the source of the news article is, whether it's the Wall Street Journal, the Dow Wire, or whatever. Now, so, what I'd like to see here, for instance, Barbara, is, the, is Apple uh, facing competition from IBM and from other companies. And right. what story is that? Uh, where is it? Uh, it's the third one down. OK, A-O. OK. Now, automatically, it will eliminate the headlines from the screen, and it will, it will, it will bring up the in entire story that we talked about. Now, if I decide that I want this story, I don't even have to go on and read the rest of it here. I can just go directly, and I can, I can print the whole thing. If you'll notice down here, there are commands saying, if you want to print the story, hit the exclamation point. Now, now the system is automatically going out to get the rest of the story so we don't have to wait. It's, as soon as it has it, it will begin to print it. Now, 
Southall would know specifically what we want to look at. However, there are other commands that at the end of the business day, if, if I were following companies that were in, in merger negotiations or in bankruptcy, whatever was my particular interest, there are symbols provided by Dow that I can go in and, and I can say, rather than saying AAPL, which is, is the Apple symbol, I can say, give me anything that came across the news today that merges were considered by companies, and it will bring up all of the companies that, were, that fell into this category and the news stories. I could do the same for bankruptcy. I could do the same if I wanted to, to look at all the news related to energy companies or, or to specific industries or to, or to government regulations. This is an extremely powerful tool for any research. One category we still haven't covered is uh, database applications. And uh, uh, I suppose uh, just about everything is a, a database application. However, uh, we're going, we, we've looked at general purpose and specific packages which, are, which we'll use for a, a great many things. What do we do with all the other things we can think of that we'd want to use a computer for? How do we maintain mailing lists. We want to print labels, we want to code our mailing lists. Does this person get a particular mailing? Is this person a business associate, a, a personal friend, a relative? How do we maintain bibliographies on the computer? How do we maintain any list, any inventory, uh, whether it be household, personal work, inventory of uh, valuable items we own with insurance uh, for insurance purposes with model numbers uh, a multitude of applications where we were going to store large amounts of information and then retrieve that information in various sequences going back to the mailing list we want our labels in zip code sequence to take advantage of bulk mailings or we want to print a report of everyone on our mailing list with their telephone number in last name sequence to carry around with us. As, uh, as secretary of the Big Apple Users Group, I use a uh, database package to maintain our mailing list and each member of the club is coded uh, as to whether they're currently paid up members. Uh, which special interest groups they belong to. Everyone who belongs to the business subgroup has a code. Uh, word processing subgroup has a code. And then I can print labels of everyone who's in the business subgroup and uh, send out those postcards and so on. So this is a very versatile application. Celeste Evangelisti is one of the McMullins neighbors and she has come down to join us after her school was out for the day. I know that uh, there are many games on the computer, but what I found interesting about what Barbara told me is that you've been doing some work with her on the Apple. Why don't you just tell us a little bit about that? Well, on the, on the blog, they have a list of people, and I, write, I fill in the people when they send in the slips, and I write their name and, and whether they're, they're current or whatever, and what their occupation is and stuff like that, and then it, it goes into the um, memory, and then when she wants to put the labels to send out a mailing, she just, you know, it would just go out with one of the labels, and I would sometimes, she'd give me the labels and the envelopes, and I'd put the labels, and I'd stuff the envelopes, and I'd give them to her, and she'd, she'd uh, mail them. Maybe we can and have I'd a little out. demonstration of the mailing list on here. Could we do that? Yeah. Sure. And I might just say that the bog is the big Apple users group. What is that I'm doing? I'm booting it. You're booting the disk, so loading the disk in, loading the program. Okay, now why don't we see if we can enter a new member into the club? Okay. Could you enter a new member? Let's enter 
Barbara Jones. Let's say that Barbara Jones has just joined the Big Apple Users Group, and we need to enter Barbara Jones into the mailing list. How would you do that? Well, let's see. So I want to process Borg and A. Okay, so you're typing in Bob. And I want to add, so I press A. Okay. And then it would say the first name, and then if it's Barbara. Well, let's say she lives at 43 Landmark Road. And, oops. And let's have her in Jonesville. Let's make it in New York. Since we made it up, I think we can get to spell it any way we want anyway. So. I spelled it Okay, no, that's all right. Now let's make up a zip code. What? Uh, 14038. How about that? Okay. Oh, we got home area telephone code. Well, uh, what would it be? What are you here? 514. One, two, three, four, five. Well, I guess that's... Oh, that's the area code. Nice. home phone. Okay, I want you to make up a number for the home phone. Each of these fields is broken up so so that if I wanted a, a report of everyone in the 914 or 514 area code, then I could select them that way. If it was uh, all with the telephone number, I wouldn't be able to do that. Mm -hmm. Now, do you... Are you able on this to display, for example, to rearrange the names on the list? Yes. If you, you wanted to see all the people that worked for some firm, for example, you could do that? It's not necessary to rearrange uh, the list. Here you have a, an ability to select uh, uh, by using what's called a, a range ID, selecting all the people within a particular category. And you, um, all it is is a selection criteria, done very easily. And Celeste, uh, coming back to you and your background in the computer, how old are you? I'm 11 years old. You're 11. I'll be 12 December 10th. Mm -hmm. This is a copy of our mailing list, which is uh, created using the same software package. And here we have uh, several lists. Many? We have it, yes. We have the list in last name sequence because that is the key that we're using. We can produce it and start starts at A and goes to Z. Then, and in this listing, we've got last name, first name, firm, position, area code, and phone. And again, last name over here so we can look up in both columns. We have another list off the same database in firm sequence. And we have in that particular listing the firm, then the last name, first name, position, phone, and the firm, again, down the right-hand column. We could uh, produce this listing in any sequence. Well, Celeste, we thank you very much for adding another dimension to our little videotape session here this afternoon.